I'm so excited to be sitting here in your Mexico City studio. Thank you so much for having us and for giving us a tour. You're originally from Copenhagen, mm -hmm. and since three years you live here in Mexico City. So yeah. maybe tell us a bit more, how did that happen? I actually moved here because of my boyfriend's work. He got offered a job here and he persuaded me to move with him, which I've been very happy with. And how did you go into starting your own brand from there? Because you moved here. That was not the original idea, right? It was not at all the original idea. I really wanted an internship at the embassy here, but I didn't speak well enough Spanish at the time, so they didn't want me. Um, I had the most awkward job interview and kind of, I said I was sufficient in Spanish, which I was not. I never really had the vision of starting a brand at all. Um, it happened quite organically. Our things were very delayed in coming to Mexico from Copenhagen. So like all my clothes and our furniture and stuff like that. Um, so I used to go to some markets and I'd find some blazers and some pants and stuff like that and I'd kind of have them altered for my measurements. And I've always like loved blazers and suit pants and stuff like that. So in that way, it was quite natural for me to wear those things. Um, yeah. And my friends, when I would visit Copenhagen, they'd ask where it was from or they'd see it like on Instagram. And then I'd make some for them and then people would ask them where it's from and then it kind of spread a little bit and then I opened an Instagram. One thing you're particularly known for is the, the set with the crop jacket and the skirt. Yeah. How did you come up with that idea? Um, well, I used to mainly just wear like the oversized men's suits and then I felt like it would be really cool to like show your waist a little bit more because yeah. I think it's such a like flattering cut with big shoulders and then showing your waist. Totally, yeah. Um, and then Lupita and I would try it out, um, my seamstress who we worked with in the beginning. And then we had the kind of leftover material of a very good quality blazer, basically. Um, and I thought it would be a shame to throw it away. Yeah. So I was like, what if we can like wrap it around me? And she looked at me like I was completely stupid. <laughs> um, but then we kind of tried it out and we kind of did some altercations and in the beginning it didn't look nice at all but we kind of got some nice sewing going on and stuff like that and I really really liked the results and yeah. it was something that also really gave us some, a lot of traction in the start. That was kind of what we were known for. Exactly yeah. How did you meet her? In one of those Mercados near where we lived I'd often walk by a seamstress like an older lady sitting and sewing and then one day when I had bought like a pair of pants or something, I came by and asked if she was able to take them in for me basically. Um, and I just thought she was really lovely. She was super interested in where I was from and I couldn't speak any Spanish, almost. Um, so basically we kind of signed our way through most of it because she didn't speak English either. We started getting a really nice friendship going yeah. and I'd basically go buy coffee for us and then we'd sit together and practice Spanish while she was kind of sewing. That's so nice. And we'd experiment together and then also with the skirt set, she is super like olden days. Um, so she was really like not crazy about the idea when I mentioned it to her first because both things are very short and stuff. Yeah. So she was super judgmental in a very like <laughs> funny, sweet way. Um, but I just remember she was like, I don't know. Like when I showed her the idea and she was like, mm -mm. How did you grow your brand from just being like a one man show to like now having this beautiful office and 20 people working for you? Slowly growing like a really nice team. Yeah. Has been a big thing for us. I'd rather be like a little bit too few people in terms of we're all running as fast as we can. We're very busy. Yeah but also someone where we have a nice time together, where we're all very interested in the work and where we just have fun together. I mean, in the beginning, we were just like release three blazers a month mm -hmm. and call it a drop. Yeah. <laughs> um, but as demand grew, then we had to kind of look for other vendors that could help supply us with pieces, but mm -hmm. also other seamstresses. So for example, Coco, who we work with, one of our seamstresses, she's employed her <laughs> one of her best friends, her daughter, the daughter's boyfriend, uh, her brother Javier as well so you kind of it's kind of spreads a little bit it expands yeah <laughs> yeah exactly slowly and then you know they couldn't keep up with demand so now we also have lovely Amado who's sitting here with us and last September or something Philip and I and my boyfriend we decided to kind of join forces and then we made it official I, that sounds like a wedding but <laughs> but then we officially started working together in January that's so cool um, which has been really 
exciting. Let's talk about the name. Why is it called Afro Studio? It's because we used to live on a street in Colonia Juarez called Habre. Ah. And when I was opening the Instagram, I didn't know what to call it. And then I thought I can always change the name later. That's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> but now I started to really like the name and then... And it's cool, like it goes back to the roots because you told me the first office you had was basically in your bedroom and like you sold pieces exactly. out of your studio, right? Exactly, it's and a full how... circle. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, so cool. So yeah, because it was just in our bedroom and then I remember when Philip was at work, I'd stand against one white wall we had like we had a very small balcony and then there was a white wall towards it and I had to kind of take some bar stools we had in our old apartment and like stack books on top of each other and then put my phone on self timer. Yeah. And then just like take pictures up against the white wall of the pieces because Philip was at work all day when it was light. So it was like, it's quite cozy to look back on. Especially because um, we also had like an office building opposite where they were just looking at me take pictures of myself like, what is she doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> yes, someone's getting a new profile picture. <laughs> Every day. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about the B. Because I'm wondering, since I received my package with a little B logo on Avril oh, Studio, yeah. what is the story behind the um, bee and the honey? Well, it's actually not that crazy a story. It's because my mum has always called me a busy bee. Oh. Oh. And then I thought it was very, um, how do you say, fitting for the brand yeah. with like bees being a big part of the kind of ecosystem and yeah. like Havre being a very, as eco-friendly a brand as I think you can be. Yeah. Um, but that's basically kind of where it came from. Was there a specific moment when you saw a need for change in the fashion industry? I like a lot of girls my age had like a big love for Zara and stuff like that where I would just like completely like recklessly buy stuff that I'd wear only a few times and then would break after a few washes. Yeah, um, same. I think I just kind of got, you know, when you get a little bit overwhelmed by your stuff, especially just before moving, we had a, I had a flea market with some friends. And I was like, all of this stuff is in such bad condition and I just bought it and stuff. And then I think after that, I just started reading more about it and kind of seeing how much toxic dye and stuff can ruin ecosystems places and how much yeah. ends in landfill and gets burnt and stuff like that. So I don't think I've bought from like a fast fashion company since before moving to here. We have so much waste and like when you learn about how much there actually is and how little res um, how little value companies put on resources both in terms of materials and the impact it has on environment but also on um, the labor behind it and how people are treated, the ones that kind of create the clothing. I'm very happy to see like so many innovative young brands having cool ideas like you with the recycling of men's vintage suits that you find here and you also use dead, dead stock fabrics now, right? Yeah. Which is something you do more in the um, more recent pieces. Yeah, we um, work a lot with mainly vintage pieces as you see here, but we've also yeah. started working with both um, some vintage dead stock silk from the 80s, perhaps early 90s, we're not quite sure. Um, but also we've started working with some vintage lace and as weird as it sounds like some vintage tablecloths. It's the one you cool. take out for nice occasions Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, from like the 60s and stuff. I, I think we've created some really lovely things with it as well. Um, they're still like very much in the works but I yeah. have it hanging over there if you want to see it. So we have this dress, this is just like a very early sample of it. So we've got like a lot of things that are going to need some changing. We also make some uh, shirts and some trousers with also made from lace and stuff. Yeah. Which basically our seamstress Coco is working with. Yeah. And she, um, she's got all the contacts for finding some nice vintage lace and suddenly she had found like a big stock of old tablecloths. Our suppliers and our seamstresses have been really good at is kind of especially being new to a country. Yes, of course. And to a city. They've been really good at being like, oh, you don't know where to find that. I know someone who can help you. And then you told me about this, the silk. Oh which yeah. Which we have here. And what are you planning to make out of those? Basically, um, we're doing a few different things. Um, we're gonna start with doing, so we do nice. some corsets. So we're gonna use some of these silks, um, which are like very limited. This is the only we could get our hands on because it was super difficult to get. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna make these corsets out of these silks. 
mm -hmm. which I think will be really beautiful. It's so one of our vendors, um, Gladiola. She, yeah. um, she works with a lot of film sets and sources vintage all the way back from the 1800s. When COVID broke out, she lost all her work and means of income. So we worked with her a lot as well. Mm -hmm. So these are some, they were some really, really big suits. Um, and the pants were too big to be able to be made smaller. Mm -hmm. um, so basically we tried to kind of make some corsets out of them. It's so creative. And I feel like that's a big misconception people have about sustainability. People think, oh, it's sustainable, so it looks boring, or it looks like mm -hmm. a potato sack. Exactly. So it's like cool to show people that's what sustainable fashion really is. Yeah. You know, like super creative, super fun to wear, super contemporary. Are there any other misconceptions you, you see in the sustainable area? I've always had this picture of like, and that's my own old notion of sustainability, that often with upcycling and stuff, you could very much tell that something was like an old blazer or a shirt or something where you're like, oh, that's fun or something like that. But it didn't really look super nice. I think from what I came across before starting Havre, because it looked very like a DIY project or something like that. We wanted to feel like something that's brand new yeah. It's been like very heavily dry cleaned and very well sewn and stuff like that. Um, so I think that's something that I've wanted to... To show people. Exactly. I that it that. can actually also be something quite exclusive, even though it's basically a lot of it's made from old men's suits. Yeah. Um, but also because the quality was so much better back then. Yeah. Clothing has gone from basically being a currency because textiles used to be like a trading currency. Yeah. And clothing has gone from being a durable to a disposable good. People put so much low value on new clothes nowadays that the quality is so bad and they can barely last for like a year or a few months sometimes that I think it's been really nice to be able to work with some incredible materials. Like we've worked, we work with cashmere, incredible quality wool, silk, yeah. silver mink, all sorts of stuff, linen, um, which has been really like incredible to actually create some really like beautiful exclusive garments from that. Because I mean, I, if I only worked with new materials, it would be so expensive for the consumer to ha have to buy. Because if I had to like source silver mink or I had to buy cashmere from you, it wouldn't be at the price point that it is now, if that makes sense. Yeah, of course. Um, so we are able to kind of maintain the quality as well. Yeah. By now your brand is such a big hit with so many models, influencers, celebrities. Um, who was the first of them to wear an Avo Studio piece and who was the first person you called when you saw it? Um, I think the first person where I was like, oh my God, that was Matilda Jerf. Cool, yeah. Who I have loved so much. Like. I, I used to follow her for a really long time and I think I sent it to my sister right away because we both really like her. Yeah, that's cool. I think I wrote to her back when I just started Havre, like just opened the Instagram with like 50 followers or something like, would love to send you a piece or something oh, yeah? like that. And did she answer right away or did it take some... I think she saw my DM like, um, <laughs> maybe six months later or something. Yeah. Um, and she's just been really, really lovely to work with and very supportive. And, and I think we've been really lucky also in terms of having some really nice relationships, both with um, some model, influencer, celebrity, whatever you call it, um, who I think we reached out to in the beginning and had no, like, almost hope that they'd answered, no expectation. Um, and then they've just been some really supportive, lovely people. A lot have answered like a long time after or something mm. like that, um, where I think they've probably come across, that's what some of them have told me anyway, that they've come across Havre on Explore or on another person or something like that. And then being like, hey, they, they follow me. And then they can see that I sent them a message a long time ago. And then we yeah. kind of get in touch which has been really, really nice. Let's talk about the beginnings again. The first drop that you did, what was the first drop? Some vintage blazers, just plain vintage blazers and some oversized suits, basically. Okay. And then after a while, we started doing like the crop blazer and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then also some crop shirts. Yeah. What is another bestseller of Avro Studio? I think, 
Another style that's been quite popular are our kind of contrasting pieces. So we have some contrasted men's blazer and some different fabrics, but also like as I'm wearing now, like contrasted pants, old oh, cool. suit pants, stuff like that. Um, contrasting suits, shirts. Which piece do you wear the most yourself? Mm, I definitely think I wear my contrasted shirt the most, mm -hmm. just because I'm very casual every day. But I also wear like our oversized men's suits a lot mm -hmm. uh, for everyday life, just because it's super easy. I always wear blazers no matter what. And then like a pair of like nicely silhouetted suit trousers that are still a little bit re relaxed, yeah. I love as well. Um, but then my favorite thing at the moment for going out and stuff, for like nicer occasions or going out for dinner, they're definitely the corsets. Yeah. Which I was, which I really love. And what does a typical workday at the Alpha Studio office look like? I think it varies a lot. Yeah. Um, I think we basically, usually if we're very good, then we'll go to the gym in the morning. Mm -hmm. We have a gym downstairs in the building. Um, just because I think that's a really good start to the day in terms of getting you know, the energy going and yeah and also I think a little bit clearer about moved and stuff mm -hmm. um, and then we get into office between eight and nine and basically get all our emails answered most of them anyway and the days are really different whether it's uploading for a new drop taking new pictures um, customer contact which I really enjoy doing um, and then also some days we go out to our seamstresses and dry cleaners and stuff like that. It's really, di really different. Really different, yeah. Whether, I think that's the thing when you have a very small business, you kind of do a little bit of everything. So I don't really have the kind of, how do you say it? I have structure, mm -hmm. somewhat. Um, but I think I don't really have the kind of typical everyday, like ev everyday changes so much. So it kind of keeps you on your toes a little bit. Yes, I think. Oh, definitely. What inspires you in your design process? I get very inspired if I'm working with upcycling in the materials themselves. So kind of playing around with the shape of it and kind of what can happen. And I often go to Kugel, one of our seamstresses, and we mm -hmm. kind of go through it together and like brainstorm together, find some ideas. So I think it's super fun to just play around with like what you find because I'm also like a business that we are a business that works with sustainable and dead stock and vintage materials. I think that it kind of allows us to kind of see these like really beautiful materials and play around with them in a way that's really fun. What was the challenge within growing your brand? Oh, where did it begin? <laughs> I think there are a lot of uh, challenges <laughs> or kind of bumps on the road. One of the challenges is defi definitely for me giving responsibility to other people, or like allowing other people in on things, especially when I, from when I did it myself last year, it was really crossing a boundary for me to let other people answer emails or be in touch with people, or stuff like that. Um, that was a really big challenge for me. Um, but I also think, as corny as it sounds, like keeping your cool in a lot of situations where it can seem extremely stressful. Yeah. Um, because oftentimes, even though you feel it's the end of the world, you've felt it a million times before, or I, I at this point have. Um, so I feel like you kind of take things a little bit easier and you kind of have yeah. to learn to kind of grow a little bit thicker skin. I think especially within fashion and kind of an industry which is super interesting and creative and fun in many ways but it's also especially in sustainable fashion such a challenge to be able to grow a brand when you kind of have a framework to act within and yeah. I wouldn't change it for anything because I love it very much and I find it so rewarding but it has definitely been a challenge which I think also gives our brand another dimension but yeah. it has you know, let some tears <laughs> at yes, some point. Of course. What was the moment you felt particularly proud within your work? Um, I think there are different 
times or like different aspects of it. I think one of the biggest ones is probably over Christmas, our dry cleaner was able to take two and a half weeks holiday, which he hasn't done since he started in the 80s. Well, um, so to be able to like provide an income that, how do you say, is able to give some stability and also let them have time with their family. But also I think seeing our seamstress be able to hi hire her family, stuff like that, that really gives me something tangible and real that I think is amazing. Because I think in many ways, there have been a lot of like exterior moments that have been fantastic and rewarding. Like if I've seen the celebrity in it, um, or like when, for example, Hailey Bieber, we had worked so hard on her. We sent to three different stylists to get, get it on her. Um, so it was crazy to see her in something after so much, so much time. So I've wanted her in it since, I mean, two years before she wore it. Yeah. But um, I think another big moment was uh, British Vogue wrote an article where it wasn't just about celebrities wearing it, but where it was about the brand and what we do. Yeah, that's cool. Which was really crazy to have like an actual meeting with someone who wanted to hear about Havre and stuff. But also the fact that you guys came all the way from New York, that's pretty crazy for me as well. That's so cool to so hear. there have been a few moments that are a bit <laughs> crazy. What is a tip you have for other rising brand owners? As corny as it sounds, don't do something that someone else is doing, but rather focus on standing out. Yeah. I don't think you should look at other brands for inspiration, but rather kind of look outside where it really inspires you. Um, and just also stay true to yourself, but remember to pivot. Yeah. Um, so I think that's quite challenging, but also necessary. Last question. With the mayor, we want to shine a spotlight on positive things in the fashion industry. We want to like, give that spotlight to you and ask you if you could hold a spotlight on another person or brand or topic in the fashion industry, what would you put the spotlight on? Oh, I think that's a very good question, but I think someone I really admire and love is I showed him to you earlier as well, but Mira Pillay. Mm -hmm. I think they produce locally in New York and I, Marcelo, who's behind the brand, he's such an artist. You can just see how much love and thought goes into his work. Uh, a lot of things also made from dead stock, and if not, they're 100% silk and stuff like that. He never overproduces. He's like incredibly talented. Such an inspiration to me. If I could shine a spotlight on one more person, yes, it would absolutely. Be, um, up next designer by Albert. I think in such a kind of competitive gatekeeping environment which fashion can be sometimes. I think that he is so good at making it graspable for new brands and people who don't know the industry very well. He's yeah. good at, you know, I've seen that recently he's made like these almost templates of, on how to reach out to stylists if you're a new brand. Like he makes it it's very awesome. much in kind of eye, eye height, if that makes sense. Yeah. And he's just extremely kind and open and fun. Cool. And I think that's really refreshing to see. Yeah, Super that's cool. amazing. Thank you so much. These are great spotlights. And thank you for all the answers and all the insights.